Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. Priscilla Gilman is the author of The Critic's Daughter, a memoir. This is actually her second time on the podcast, and I am so happy she's back. Priscilla is a former professor of English literature at both Yale University and Vassar College and the author of The Anti-Romantic Child, a story of unexpected joy. The Critic's Daughter will be published by Norton. She graduated from Yale summa cum laude with exceptional distinction in the English major. She went on to earn her master's and PhD in English and American literature at Yale and spent two years as an assistant professor of English at Yale and four years as an assistant professor of English at Vassar College before leaving academia in 2006. From 2006 to 2011, she worked as a literary agent at Janklow and Nesbitt Associates, representing a wide range of literary fiction, inspirational memoir, wellness, and psychology and education books. During those years, she also taught poetry appreciation to inmates in a restorative justice system and to New York City public school students. She also spoke at numerous early childhood and education conferences and events. Welcome, Priscilla. Thank you so much for coming back on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. You were here before for The Anti-Romantic Child and now The Critic's Daughter, a memoir. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Priscilla, this book, oh my gosh, I actually cried. I haven't cried in a book in a really, really long time. And I I never want to make you cry. No, no, no. It was so amazing. (laughs) <laughs> the part when you quoted Charlotte's Web, and I know I have like a thing about it, but in the context of the story and like, oh my gosh, it's really great. And by the way, we have like the yeah. same life. You Every, <gasps> I mean, I know we went to the same grade school and college and we were only a couple <laughs> years apart, but I was like, okay, I just read every cultural Per, like personal reference of my entire life in this book. Wow, that's right? amazing. Crazy. Yeah. And Zibby, those Charlotte's Web lines, oh my gosh. When I did the audiobook, I recorded my own audiobook. I only cried three times, and one of them was that time. What were they? I had to things? stop. I, I looked at the engineer. I was like, oh. yeah. Uh, the others were actually, it's interesting. None of them, I didn't make myself cry with my own prose. One of them was my sister's eulogy for my oh, dad yeah. when I was reading that about the magical childhood and how we could have shared more with him. And then one of them was his own lines about not wanting to die, wanting mm-hmm. to be remembered, wanting to give comfort to the people that he left behind, wipe away their tears. Those lines where he's echoing Uncle Vanya. I found out later. I didn't know when I first read it, but yeah. Wow. Well, I jumped yeah. right in so fast. Why don't you tell listeners what your book is about? <laughs> Oh, wow. Uh, My book is about my father, Richard Gilman, who was a theater critic, a professor at the Yale School of Drama, and a writer. And it started out as a book about criticism and culture in the 70s. Uh, it was going to be much more about his cohort. Other, He was very close friends with many famous critics from Susan Sontag, Elizabeth Hardwick, Christopher Lehman, Hampton, and Anatole Boyard, who were the two lead New York Times book critics, Stanley Kaufman, a film critic. And it morphed into a really personal story. It is a story about a lost New York. It is a story about a lost culture and an era in the arts and criticism. But it is a very personal family story about my complicated relationship with my complicated father, whom I adored, revered, and then lost for the first time. The first line of the book is, I lost my father for the first time when I was 10 years old. And that line came to me, Zibby. I don't know where it came from. And I got that line and then the critic's daughter, the title came to me and I was like, okay, I'm going to be able to do this because I had been putting off writing a book about my father and my agent, Tina Bennett, 
who was my friend in grad school, and she's a character in the book. Remember, she talks to my dad about trying to make his writing into a book when he has cancer. And she said, this is the book you have to write. And you a child, wonderful, great. But, you know, you really need to go back and talk about your dad. Uh, so I got that line and that title, and it was off to the races. And it became so much more about me than I originally thought it was going to be. And about my evolution as a, as from a girl to a woman. And my parents had a very, very bitter divorce. I'm wondering if that's one of the points of reference, Ibby, with your life. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, what it's like to love both of your parents very, very much and have them possess so much animosity and bitterness between them and feel like you're caught in the middle. And my father was an extremely brilliant but very troubled person. And being the child of somebody who struggles with depression, self-medicates with smoking, ultimately dies of lung cancer, which I always knew he would, even though he said, no, my parents lived until they were 90 something and they smoked, but I knew it. And the pressure that I felt even before my parents split up when I was 10, uh, to keep my father in a good mood, to pull him out of his darkness, to help him to bring sunshine and light and joy and fun and play into his life because he had this very playful, joyful, childlike side. And he was an incredible father in so, so many ways. Uh, and when I was a little girl, you know, just a magical, wild, zany figure who adored reading to us and watching the PBS shows with us. I know you watch those. And um, joining in our games. And he honored our belief that our stuffed animals were alive. And he talked to them. And it was, just, you know, and he took us to the library to take all the books out. And, you know, he was... He was just magical, completely magical, but dark, had a dark side or had darkness in him. I don't like the phrase dark side. He had darkness in him as we all do. Well, I feel like even though he loved childhood and made yours so special and, you know, even things like you, you, you had the one when you were in Weston, I guess, and he would have you dive off his shoulders in the pool and all of that because oh, oh that was in Italy yeah Italy sorry in Italy yes um, my yes. dad used to do the same thing oh my gosh yep. but you know all of this of his love of childhood it he inadvertently though like stole yours because you had to grow up so quickly and take yeah. care of him so much and there yep, was yep. so much pressure on you and honestly I first of all I feel like I understand you like so well at least all that what you shared. I mean, the book is about your dad, but it's really your, I mean, I guess that's why it's the daughter. I mean, it's, it's making sense of you and how you're working through all of this. And there's so yeah. much, I mean, yeah. we all have, we all have so much for so many, you know, and so, with our relationships with our families and whatever, but you know, all the pressure to take care of him to even when his friend, when you were visiting the friends and <gasps> would like leave his glasses and cigarettes burning and you were like, you girls <laughs> yes. don't even mind. You were just like, oh, daddy, another glass, whatever. You know, just all of the things from making sure he's okay to yep. his emotional state. I mean, yep. that takes a lot of toll in a developing child. Uh, it really does. And I think I never sort of slowed down enough to acknowledge that or see it. And I remember talking with you last time when we were talking about anti-romantic child. You know, I've gone through a lot of challenges. We all do. But I, I had a lot of major challenges at a young age. When my father is dying of cancer, when I'm in my 20s and I'm married and my mother-in-law has just died of cancer. And then I have a child with developmental disabilities. It turns out to be autism. But my marriage is falling apart. I'm in a tenure track job in academia. I am just soldiering on. Mm -hmm. I am I am not wanting to slow down and cry or say, oh, this is hard, this is difficult, because I'm in that mode that my parents trained me to be in from a very young age, which is the smiley one, the poised one, the caretaker, the one who brings strength and cheer and and steadiness to everybody else. Wait, I have a pat I, I loved that part of the book. So wait, oh, I'm gonna read this good. passage. Thank you're you. talking, 
you said, you know, this insistence on soldiering on through disappointment, trauma, and loss, this buoyant optimism had served me well as I weathered my parents' split, Sarah's illness and death, Benji's special needs, and my father's diagnosis and diminishment, but they came at a cost. I didn't allow myself to truly feel or acknowledge the terror, disorientation, and profound sadness that must have accompanied these situations and experience, and I certainly didn't share those feelings with others. I feared being a burden. I feared undermining the listener's own well-being. I feared a appearing weak and vulnerable rather than strong and capable. I feared not being able to parent effectively if I leaned into or came face to face with my own wounded child. I feared playing anything other than the role I'd been assigned at a very young age, the happy, resilient, reliable one who counseled and supported, cheered up and calmed others. Even though the role and the self were closely related, even though I'd been chosen for the role because it wasn't a stretch, playing it to the hilt took a toll. You just made me teary because you read that with such empathy, Sibby. Yeah. I mean, that totally jumped out at me when I read it because it, it's so easy, isn't it? To just like not, not to hide it all, right? And just keep going. <laughs> he, he hide it all and keep going. And I know that you understand that better than most people do, Sibby. So. I'm not saying, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's funny when you were reading it, I heard something different in it. You know, I use the role that, and obviously I'm t- I, I, I do, you know, engage a lot with this idea of how in families, children get slotted into certain roles and you know, how I very much tried to avoid that with my own kids, even though I did write a piece called Ernie and Bert's Mother, where I slotted them into the roles. And then right (laughs) after I wrote it, they were like, oh, wait, actually, I'm more like Bert, mom. And he's more like Ernie. Um, But also, of course, that word role, you know, I'm playing on the, I play on theatrical metaphors and similes right throughout the book. And I structured it in acts. And that was a big formal decision to do it in acts. It was three acts. Was it four acts? Was it five acts? Then I, I stretched it as much as I could, Zibby. And then I added an apple. <laughs> so, you know. Wait, just on this topic again, you wrote, in the fall of 2017, I unearthed a bin of old things from my mother's basement. And it was a diary I'd kept in middle school. Here is a page from that diary. Things not to do when I'm with daddy. One, don't cry. Two, don't complain. Three, don't be difficult. Four, don't tell him anything but good news. Five, don't mention mommy. Six, don't expect him to be the daddy of old. That is heartbreaking. I, I almost, I couldn't believe it. I, I didn't have any memory of it, Zibby. And I'm flipping through and there's like entries about, oh, this new, you know, go-go song is so great. Or like, oh, this cute boy, like he, I'm going to slow dance with him at the, at the dance. And then there was just this. And it went right in there. Like, Doesn't it like break your heart to mm-hmm. think of you as a kid going through this? Do you know what I mean? Now that you have kids? Yes. You know, what's interesting. I, my agent and my editor, both of them would say to me at various points, we have like, I have so much empathy for little Priscilla. Mm-hmm. I want you to have more empathy for little Priscilla. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that was one of the hardest parts of the book is to go back into it. And, you know, pictures were really important. I, I, I put up a picture of myself just a few months before the split on Instagram yesterday and just looking at how little I was, you know, and then I think, oh my gosh, I'm 10 years old. Like I cannot imagine my children who are a college first year to recent college graduate now, but I can imagine them at 10 finding out the stuff that I found out, being experiencing and going through what I did, seeing one of their parents in so much distress and so much pain. I, it's, it's, it's unfathomable to me. And that the, they asked you to keep all this a secret for a long time. Oh yeah. I mean, oh, that yeah. is so hard. Zibby, isn't that interesting? Because I remember you asked, when we were talking about intermittent child, I remember you asking me about when Benj first had all these challenges. Mm-hmm my ex-husband uh, asking me to keep it a secret, mm. not to tell anyone because he didn't want a school or family friends perception of Benjamin to be shaped by an idea of disorder in some way. And I think, you know, when people ask me, how did you become a memoirist from being an academic and writing a dissertation and, and you're also a critic and how can you do all this personal stuff in a way, merely telling the truth and sharing things that are hard and sharing things that were difficult and going back in and 
um, with empathy and a sense of sadness for that little girl. That in and of itself is correcting the past, right? Mm-hmm. It's it, it's me saying, I don't have to keep secrets anymore. I don't because do you remember there's that part in the book where Joel Kremens? Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, I, I don't know if she that. took your picture too. She, um, it is hanging down. Okay, in the I, I, yeah, they're, they're really are the best for pictures. Yeah, amazing, they're really amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, she's doing this book, How Children Feel When Their Parents Divorce, and she asks us to do, she asks yep. me and my sister to write for it or participate in it, be photographed for it. And my mother's like, you don't want to talk about it. That's private. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, I don't want to talk about it because I'd have to say a lot of very painful things and possibly expose my father and some of his his mm-hmm. actions that are less than savory and paint my mother, you know, and, and I just thought, I can't do this. and in a way, I'm doing it now. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Jill Kremens, for being the first person to ask me to talk about it, honestly and openly. I'm doing it now. I just connected with her like in the last couple months. If you want me to put you two in touch, you could like have a, you could almost do a a reprise of the whole thing. Oh, I'm I'm her Facebook friend and she likes the post. And every time she does, I'm like, (laughs) yes, yes. Oh, That was just one of like the thousands of things. I really couldn't even believe it. I mean... I, I just, it's, I, I, I mean, it's not even worth going into how many references <laughs> that were all the same, but, um, did you read uh, the Betsy Tacy books? Sibby? I read the Betsy Tacy books and you reminded me of another series that I had totally forgotten about. It was in the same sentence, like the ever after girls. Wait, what was it? Oh, the Melody books. No, no. It was the same sentence though. It was, hold on. I'll find it. You said, I'm looking up at my, at my, I circled it. Uh, Children's books, which are my, my academic eBooks are behind me. You can see them on the video in front of of the kind family. books. Oh, they're so good. Oh my gosh. I had forgotten all about them. They're, they're fantastic. This was so my life, like (laughs) the beauty products, the Noxtema, <laughs> Seabreeze, Clearasil, Flex and Finesse, Johnson's Baby Shampoo, Band Deodorant, Bonnie Bell, Lip Smackers. Like, it was like you opened up my childhood medicine cabinet and like took me back on like a time travel. I mean, that was the, that was so much fun. How did remember you remember that? all this? I have a really good memory. Like ask any of my friends from elementary, middle school, and I can tell you like what they wore to the dance. Like if it was it a purple off the shoulder sweatshirt capri pants. I have an incredible memory. And I really do. I just remember it's so vivid to me. And then if I wasn't quite sure, I did a lot of research. I actually did do a lot of incredibly fun romping through rabbit holes and going on old Upper West Side websites and tribute books and remembering the green noodle, like all the restaurants and the stores. And it was so much fun. It was, it's crazy. You literally recreated (laughs) the same world. Um, you know, I, and I also, by the way, I got mono at Yale my freshman year, but I know yours wasn't diagnosed till later wow. with all of your sinus infections, but <laughs> yes. I could not believe that you took time off and were a, an instructor at Gilda's aerobics class, which I also used to take. I mean, it's incredible. Oh, Zibby, um, that was the most fun. And I don't know if you read my interview with Tertulia. Uh, they asked me about bookstores. It just went up and I yes, said, well, I, I tried it. to get a job at Shakespeare and Company, but they were like, you're a sophomore at Yale. You, have enough, you don't have enough literary and philosophical range. So, so I was like, okay, I'll go audition and to be an aerobics teacher. And I ended up teaching stretch and firm, body sculpting and step to Mary Tyler Moore, Elizabeth Shu, Mary Stuart Masterson, Connie Chung, and the list goes on. Unbelievable. Yes. So fun. So much fun. You have just a little bit at the end about how you processed all of this stuff and the aftermath of the loss and your relationships and the inappropriate men and all of this. Um, And I was like, I feel like there's another memoir right in this section here. (laughs) Oh, I think those men would beg to differ. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it could be it. Maybe it'll be a novel or something. You know, Zippy, I may take a page out of your book. <laughs> it may be a novel. <laughs> <laughs> From memoir to fiction. Yes. <laughs> do you feel, how do you feel like that this is all out there? And the, A, that you went through the, pro, like, what was it right even going through emotionally writing this all down and all, all of the, like, what was it like for you? 
it was really hard. I will say, you know, when people ask me how long did it take you to write this, I started working on it in 2015. And I teach very more than full time. Like I lead six book groups. I teach for alumni college. I teach a writing class. I'm a private writing coach. I'm a meditation teacher. And I really don't have much time to write. Uh, and I had two kids, you know, getting my son into college and the other one getting Benjamin, my autistic son, transitioned to college and all of that. So I, when I started writing it, we sold it in 2017 as a proposal. And, you know, I would go a month or two without working on it. And then, and, and in part, I think it was good that I was working so much and consumed with parenting because I really, I don't think emotionally I could have done this like mm-hmm. in a stretch. Mm-hmm. I just don't think I could. Like the idea of a writing retreat to me, I, I just don't think it would, it would work for me. I do well when I write, I'll have a weekend. I'm like, this is my weekend where I'm going to go in and I'm going to write a couple of scenes. Mm-hmm. And then I might not look at it again for a month. Um, and, and sometimes that was really emotionally necessary to me because there was a lot of crying Yeah, while I was working on this. And there were also moments where I would finish a scene and just feel completely hollowed out and just, oh my gosh, I, I, I need to go meditate. Meditation was key. A lot of sleep was key, but in terms of it coming out, you know, it's, it's very scary. Um, I mean, if the Andrew Mantic child was personal, this is this is even more so. And, you know, in the Kirkus, I had a wonderful Kirkus review, anonymous Kirkus reviewer, whoever you are, <laughs> you really read with such empathy and appreciation. And I absolutely love the review, but they did describe my mother as cruel. Mm. And, and I took that as a sign that they were reading the book with an abundance of empathy for little Priscilla. And they were just thinking, you know, it's cruel to tell a child terrible things about their father when they're 10, whatever. I don't think my mother was cruel. I don't think she did it to hurt me. I don't think she did it, you know, with some kind of twisted agenda. I think she, we did not know how to talk about divorce to children. Um, this is 1980, 1981. Uh, she was not in therapy. We never got therapy till much later. And I think she genuinely thought I'm helping her process this and come to terms with this very complicated man. Because remember, I'd found that letter that my father wrote yeah. to his first wife where there was all the sexual details in it. And that's what started her trying to explain and account for it to me. And I think she wanted me to understand why she had to end the marriage. And I absolutely agree that she had to end the marriage. Like, I mean, I am so glad my parents split up. It, it would have been terrible if they had stayed together. They both ended up much happier and more fulfilled apart. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that the split itself didn't take an enormous toll on me. Well, I don't think she came across as cruel. I mean, I think what came across the most for me was like your your longing for her to understand, to like forgive your dad, to like make peace with with who he was and to sort of go back to when she loved him. I think you just- Exactly, exactly. Zibby, you nailed it. And- I remember I, I interviewed the amazing, incredible writer, Lori Siegel. Read her books, everyone. She's in her 90s and still going and one of my parents' closest friends. And I interviewed her a few times when I was working on the book. And she has such fond, vivid memories of my parents in the early days of their relationship and their marriage. And she said, you know, there was so much that was good in their connection. Mm-hmm. And they were very, they had the same values. They had the same passion for literature and the arts and the same adoration of their children. Right. I mean, and I think that they, they created two interesting children. Uh, And my sister and I always talk, my sister's my best friend. We always talk about how we are so weird because we're a combination (laughs) of our two very different parents, right? Like we have, I have, I do have my mother's steely resolve and her ability to be a great advocate, which she used as an agent. And I have used as a parent of two children with special needs, right? I mean, we all get bits and pieces from our parents. And I think the ultimate message of my book, right, is being able to look at your parents as human beings Mm -hmm. and understand that their own demons and their own complicated histories and why they did what they did and not to blame and not to reduce them to something simple because none of us were simple. We're all complicated. And I feel like 
in the end of the book, you know, there's that moment where my mother finally does. She finally mm-hmm. gives me that affirmation yeah. about my dad. And I think so many people who have bad splits can identify with my mom, right? Where you don't want to acknowledge that there's anything good about the person. Mm-hmm. And in a way, sometimes it's to separate yourself, right? Because you need to get out. And so you have to cut, you have to shut down the part of you that loves that person or the part of you is my mom. My dad was draining my mom as he drained me. Yeah. You know, well, then there was all that stuff that came out. I mean, from her, from what you found out, I mean, it must've been hard, right? It's, I mean, it's hard to, I don't know. There's no good way. There's no good way. I say this to my mom all the time. I was talking to her this weekend and I was like, she said, Oh, if I've made mistakes, I, you know, I'm so sorry. And I said, mom, you don't have to ever apologize. Like, they're all parents make mistakes. Mm-hmm. You know, I want the same forgiveness for myself. We all make mistakes and there's no right way. Yeah. If she had done it when we were younger, that would have had its own problems. If she had waited, that would have had its own problems. If she had not told me and I'd found out later, right? I'm, I, I think about like Wally and Alan Sean and how they found out that their father had another family mm-hmm. and other kids and they hadn't known and they found mm-hmm. out in their thirties. That's its own kind of drama. Yeah. Right. So you also, though, could have written, like, the literary agent's daughter. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yes. A, a reviewer on Goodreads wants me to do that. They're like, we, I hope that she will do a memoir about her mother, the Nesbitt mm. next. And I said, and I don't think that's happening. No. <laughs> <laughs> was this, was it hard for her? Like, was it hard for Claire and your mom? Like, was it okay? How did everybody in your ecosystem feel about having all of this out there? Were they okay with it? Did you check with them? Like, what was it I like? I did check with them. You know, my mom is not going to read it. Okay. My, my ex-husband didn't read my first book. Very similar reasons. They don't want to go into the pain. They don't want to go into... My mother hates reading anything about herself. So there are a lot of books that my mother is in, right? I mean, she is in The Year of Magical Thinking. <laughs> I think she did read that one. Um, but she's in... There's a biography of Donna Barthelme that she's featured extensively in. And she sent me to Borders to read the sections that she's in. She can't stand to read anything about herself. I think it's I think it's good. My ex-husband actually did read this one and helped me with it. Oh. Knows my mother very well. Uh we're very close, we're very good friends and but didn't read the first one. So I think I did interview both my mom and my sister mm-hmm. um and my brother. Uh yep. who's not my mother's son but my half brother right. Nikki. Um he was a fount of information. Oh my gosh, he sent me long pages long letters with his memories and things. And it was very validating because he, he said, you know, I never thought they would get divorced either. And he was older. So I thought, well, maybe it was just me. And I was like, didn't think it. And he was like, no, no, no. It was completely shocking. And he said, yeah. And they, they both yelled when they fought. It wasn't just your, it wasn't just our dad. She, she yelled back, you know, Mm -hmm. so I, I checked a lot of things with them. I wanted to get their take and their perspectives. So when you think about the reader of the book, what do you want the reader to get out of this? Oh, I want, oh, I feel so warmly towards my, towards my readers and my potential readers, because I hope that I do think just as I did with the anti romantic child, I do think this is a universal story. And I think that Benji, right? My son who has autism, it's called the anti romantic child because he was the opposite in many ways of what I was expecting or predicting or projecting as a parent. And then I, so you go through this romanticization of what being a parent is going to be. And then there's all this disorientation, disappointment, loss, whatever of what you think. And then you come to a deeper sense of romanticism, right? Where you see your child as he or she actually is rather than who you want he or she to be. And I think that this book is, even though my father is obviously a very idiosyncratic, he's really an original. I mean, his life in and of itself, there's probably going to be a biography at some point. It's, wow. The conversion to Catholicism, all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Even as he's very eccentric and idiosyncratic, I think all of us at some point in our lives, we worship an adult and then we come to see that adult as flawed, having limitations, right? Much more complicated than we thought. We have to come to terms with seeing them, uh, with greater complexity and in greater depth or whatever. And then how do we get to that place where we recover the sense of wonder and magic and love and also mystery? Because, you know, my father's memoir was called Faith, Sex, mm-hmm. Mystery. Great title. No ands, just faith, comma, sex, comma, mystery. 
Uh, and I think, you know, I, even as I'm writing this book about my dad and attempting to capture him and attempting to revive him in some way, I, I wanted, I want the reader to end the book with a sense of reverence for mystery because my father would want it that way, right? We are all, even as we should strive to know each other and accept each other and love each other with empathy and attunement, right, to individuality, respecting the essential mystery of every person is another value that I think my father taught me. Wow. Yeah. Priscilla, oh my gosh. Thank you. Thanks for this book, Yay. this conversation. I was so just completely immersed. My heart was like open, like it, it, for you the whole time. I oh. I just feel like this was such a personal intimate account. And anyway, it was really great. So thank you. Zibi, I'm so, so touched by your reaction. Thank you so much. Thank you. Always Bye. wonderful to talk to you. You too. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music.